Thank you. So we've got about 22 participants so far. We may double that number. So we probably have some individuals coming in over the next few minutes. But I wanted to kick off this presentation today by greeting everyone, saying hi. My name is Kai Palinsker. I work for the San Bernardino Valley Municipal Water District, the water district in the city of San Bernardino. And the reason why we're discussing this topic today is because um, as a water district, we care about water. Um, we provide water to entities, other water districts, um, provided to the public. So water quantity and quality are two things that we you know, need to provide um, for, for purposes, for human use. And so um, both of those considerations from our local mountains, whenever there's a large catastrophic wildfire, you know, water resources are degraded. You know, after that fire burns and the rains occur, we get landslides, uh, a lot of biomass, a lot of char, a lot of soils coming out of our local watersheds. And that um, kind of impedes the purpose uh, valley district and others to capture water for human use and that water at least in our valley is, is largely put into the ground into the groundwater system so in order to um, kind of prevent or ameliorate some of that kind of catastrophic effect of wildfire and degradation of water resources we're looking into ways to resist or make our forests more resilient to catastrophic wildfires and one way to do that is through this production of biochar. So the forest, the US Forest Service and others, um, through biomass reduction, they take trees that are dead or shrubs that may uh, uh, create ladders for fires to you know, move into the treetops and the tree canopies. A lot of that biomass right now is cut as slash and then burned in the forest just to remove that biomass. And it's essentially a waste product. Just for you. The formation of biochar would turn that product into oh. a resource that's beneficial to the forest um, or for agricultural uses. You don't have to go to it? So biochar will be talked about by Raymond in just a minute through his presentation as to what it is, um, what its benefits are for, and the reason why Valley District is funding, funding this demonstration project, which will happen on the 8th, which will show us kind of the process of making biochar on a small scale. Um, you're all invited to that, um, but this is an introduction to that field exercise, a demonstration you know, this project. Is gonna involve your healthcare and you know, sure. if we can turn that biomass into a product that's fairly you know beneficial and useful. Um, it serves us all well, including water resources downstream. So that's why Valley District's involved. Um, I'll turn it over now to, to Raymond Baltar and David Morrell. Uh, they're both with the Sonoma Biochar Initiative. You should on your screen see a presentation that Raymond will provide right now. So Raymond, please take it away. Okay, great. Uh, so if, if everybody could mute, that'd be great. Um, so thank you very much, Kai. Uh, we really appreciate this opportunity to both give this presentation and to come down in a couple of weeks and um, into your area and give a a demonstration of uh, two techniques, one called the conservation burn and another flame cap kiln. So uh, I also want to introduce uh, David Morell. He's the, uh, David, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, I'm glad to be here and to uh, make this uh, possible with uh, working with our, our good friends at the San Bernardino Municipal Water District. I'm David Morell. I'm uh, president of the board of directors of Sonoma Ecology Center and the senior director of our biochar projects. Raymond and I have had the pleasure for about the past decade uh, of chasing the biochar uh, magic around trying to uh, further understand what it is, how to make it, how to use it, and how to offset uh, ongoing greenhouse gas emissions by getting elemental carbon into the ground. Take it over, Raymond. Great. Thank you, David. So uh, I do wanna say that I'm gonna give this presentation and then we're gonna have a short five minute video um, that is from a project that we worked with the Redwood Forest Foundation and the USAL Redwood Forest Company up in Mendocino County using uh, the kilns that we're gonna show you. Uh, it's a pretty cool little video. So I'll just go ahead and start out. Uh, first, I wanted to talk a little bit uh, quickly about what the Sonoma Ecology Center does. The Sonoma Biochar Initiative is a project of the Sonoma Ecology Center and has been very supportive. 
for the last 10 years of the project and uh, we're very thankful for that. So we have three main areas that we work in. Uh, we do environmental education. We have a great K through six watershed education program. We have Enviro Leaders, which is a uh, high school engagement program. We do California Naturalist programs, nature walks. We also manage two parks. One of them is a uh, state park and the other is a really cool uh, city park in the city of Sonoma. Um, we also do uh, environmental restoration. We are dedicated to restoration, stewardship, and ecosystem uh, enhancement, um, fuels reduction, ecological forestry, and kiln and prescribed burns. And then we also have a research department uh, where we do a lot of stream flow stewardship, watershed health monitoring, steelhead data, and the biochar program is within the uh, environmental research program. So uh, the, the Sonoma Biochar Initiative uh, trains and educates people about biochar and how it contributes to sustainable energy production and sustainable forestry and farm management by saving and using carbon that um, is typically just burned up and, and uh, considered as a waste. So it's really not a waste and we need to learn how to uh, better manage that. That's part of what we do. Uh, we manage biochar related great grant projects. We just concluded a, a four year project for the Department of Water Resources. Um, Cal, we're working currently for, on a CAL FIRE uh, project, USDA, North Coast Resource Partnership and, and other projects as well. We consult and manage uh, biochar projects for landowners and organizations, including the Redwood Forest Foundation, of which we, I think I've done four different uh, projects for them uh, over the years, um, earth foundries and several tree companies. And we've found that uh, urban um, tree companies are a very rich source of a lot of quote unquote waste material that often gets landfilled or just burned or, um, or even chipped. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and really it's a, it's a perfect uh, stream of material that uh, we can turn into uh, something better. We also connect people to biochar resources and hopefully we, along the way, we inspire and energize others to, to use biochar. We're also big on collaborations. Um, obviously we're uh, collaborating here with the uh, San Bernardino Valley Municipal Water District, but we work with uh, farmers and ranchers and landowners, as I mentioned. We're currently uh, working on a project I'll mention in a while with uh, CAPCOA and other local air districts have been very supportive of us forestry organizations um, and other nonprofits such as fire safe councils. So here's just a quick uh, kind of an illustration of, of how biochar is made. You can take any kind of biomass, organic biomass, feed it through uh, some sort of a sort report, a pyrolysis or a gasification system, or in some of the do-it-yourself methods we're gonna show you and out comes uh, particularly with these more advanced technologies, biochar, syngas, uh, pyrolysis oil, um, sometimes called wood vinegar, and also heat. Uh, and the syngas and heat can uh, be used to uh, produce renewable energy. So it, it's biochar is just a specialized form of charcoal that's created when biomass is heated at high temperature uh, in low oxygen environments. And it, uh, again, can create several other byproducts at the same time. So biochar is also a form of charcoal that's suitable for use in row crop or greenhouse agriculture, animal agriculture, and silviculture. It's an elemental form of carbon that can last for centuries without degrading. And this is one of the key qualities of it. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, but it, it does depend on a number of factors and uh, including the temperature that it was made at, the type of biomass that was used, the process that was used, how it is used uh, once it's uh, in that uh, very stable carbon form, et cetera. Uh, and different forms of biochar can also be produced for industrial use, um, such as for water and air filtration. Um, there are a lot of studies going on now for uh, stormwater filtration. Uh, in cities around the, around the state and around the country. Um, it can be used as a pollution remediation material or in many other ways as a replacement, sort of a poor person's uh, um, activated carbon. So biochar is not like cooking oil. Kai, you had asked about this yesterday, uh, or cooking charcoal. 
the biomass is heated at a higher temperature than, than cooking charcoal is made at so that it releases all of the volatile gases that are produced during the process and to make it as pure a form of carbon as possible. So I just wanted to kind of show you this, this uh, quick illustration here. An old friend of mine likes to say that wood doesn't burn. And what he meant by that, and just looking at this, uh, the stick match here, you can see that once the, you know, if you, if you, if you probably all use them in the past, you strike the accelerant at the top. Uh, and what happens is it uh, starts interacting, the flame starts interacting with the wood part, which produces gases. So when the cellulose and hemicellulose portion of the wood are heated to a certain temperature, they turn into these volatile gases. And it's actually the gases that feed the fire for the most part. So up to half of that carbon that was contained in the match, you know, you've all seen at the end, you, you're in this little stick of black carbon. Uh, and that's what's left. That's what we're sort of calling the biochar. So when we're making biochar, we want to burn off all of the volatiles, leaving just the pure carbon. And when conducting a conservation burn or a kiln burn, which we'll show you in a little bit, we managed uh, the, the burn to maximize the amount of carbon that's preserved. So biochar is highly porous and adsorptive. It's also absorptive. Um, it incubates life like uh, in soil, like a coral reef does in the ocean. That's kind of a really good analogy. Um, it looks like a sponge under a microscope as in these pictures here. And uh, we call it, like to call it a condo for microorganisms because there's uh, lots of spaces for them to populate and uh, have a good home. One gram of char can have up to 300 square meters of surface area. If you think about that, it's, it's pretty amazing, depending on, of course, how it's processed. And it can hold up to five times its own weight in water and dissolved nutrients. Another way to look at biochar is that when put into soil, it's a direct deposit of soil organic matter and soil organic carbon. It's easily measured, it's easily accounted for, and it's now much sought after by emerging voluntary carbon markets. And there are several of those. Uh, there have been some big sales in California so far uh, from some big companies like uh, Pacific Biochar and Phoenix Energy. Biochar is not a fertilizer per se, though it can contain some nutrients. Uh, you need to just think of it as a storage container that can both deliver nutrients and store water for slow release over time. So there are two main ways, uh, processes or process variations that make biochar called pyrolysis and gasification. Pyrolysis is uh, generally uh, uh, runs between about 300, 350 C up to 700, 750 C temperature. It's a thermochemical decomposition of organic matter into non-condensable gases, condensable liquids, and a solid residual co-product of carbon, biochar, uh, charcoal, whatever you want to call it. Gasification is a higher temperature process, and it's a similar but it's generally uh, used for, um, especially in the larger plants for energy production um, with some conversion into a high ash, low carbon byproduct that can be converted or screened into a higher carbon product biochar. And this is what one of the companies uh, in California, Pacific Biochar has done is it's, uh, it's able to adapt to the larger cogen plants to, um, to make a higher quality uh, biochar product. Um, there are both low tech uh, and high tech options for how to make biochar. I'm gonna show you some of those here in the, in the presentation. Um, so I'll just kind of move forward here. Uh, first, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the lab and field studies that have shown that biochar uh, improves water retention, reduces soil compaction, improves plant production, not always, but in, especially in degraded soils. The worst soils you use biochar in, the more impact you'll have on building a more healthy soil and getting better plant production. It improves soil porosity and uh, soil tilt, and it promotes root development. And I wanted to show you an example of that here. Uh, this is a Nova Vine company, which is a nursery for grapevine starts and olive tree starts in the Sonoma Valley. And they did an experiment last year. Um, they're, their typical planting mix is on the right-hand side there. Um, and then uh, they used a 5% addition of biochar on the left-hand side. And you can see the significant 
uh, root differences there. Obviously, if you look at the stock, it's a little hard to tell, but that's also larger and the plant was much larger as well. So they're very excited about using biochar, uh, not only to improve plant growth, but also possibly to replace perlite, which is a mined resource. So lab, lab studies have also, and field studies have also shown that it decreases nutrient leaching, improves cation exchange capacity, promotes growth of mycorrhizal fungi. And there's a really interesting symbiotic relationship with fungi and, uh, and biochar. Uh, we're still studying that, but it, there's a real interesting relationship. And it generates additional soil organic carbon over time. So it's not only a direct deposit, but it also increases the soil organic carbon over time. Other biochar benefits, uh, you, you can look at biochar uh, management or waste management um, uh, from urban and wildland forestry, which I mentioned, and from agriculture. It's a way to better manage the material that we call waste that really is just improperly used resources. Uh, the production techniques that we're going to show you uh, can reduce smoke pollution significantly and also provide a valuable product to help offset fuels reduction costs. Again, as I had mentioned, it can be used as a filtration media for uh, air and water, and it's potentially a carbon negative form of renewable energy. In order to know that, you have to perform a life cycle analysis of each biochar method or facility. It's really important for that determination, but it is possible to be considered a carbon negative form of energy. Also, it's a way to sequester carbon, and I'll talk more about that. Up to 40% of the plant carbon can be conserved in a very stable form for hundreds or even thousands of years, depending on the production process. And biochar also improves the, the environment in other ways. Uh, one study uh, by a very well-known uh, biochar resource uh, researcher, Johannes Lehmann, and several others uh, showed that it reduced nitrous oxide emissions in soil uh, in their study by 50 to 80%. And most industrial agriculture uses massive amounts of chemicals and other uh, nutrients, et cetera, that can cause massive amounts of uh, nitrous oxide emissions. And nitrous oxide, as many of you probably know, is a much more potent greenhouse gas. So if we used biochar ubiquitously in, in uh, industrial ag, we could drastically reduce the nitrous oxide emissions. Also at scale, another study showed that uh, only using surplus agronomic materials, ones uh, that uh, uh, it, it could reduce uh, and sequester up to 12% of annual anthropogenic carbon emissions. So uh, biochar is not gonna solve global warming, but it's certainly one slice of the pie that we can very easily integrate into our management techniques at this point. So it's just, it's, uh, that's why we're here and that's what we're trying to uh, educate people about. It has also been shown to reduce phosphorus and nitrogen leaching in groundwater. It reduces methane release during composting operations. It also speeds up the composting operations. Um, and it's, uh, it's inoculated at the same time. I'll talk about that in a bit. And it's very effective at absorbing heavy metals. So it's been shown to help regenerate uh, degraded soils and uh, around uh, you know, old abandoned mines, et cetera, things like that. So uh, it's really being looked at, especially even in urban environments, um, to be able to capture some of the heavy metals that come off of roads and um, things like that. So there's a lot of research going on in that area as well. Just to show you one uh, particular project that was pretty interesting, the Santa Cruz Resource Conservation District uh, put together a two acre biofilter or bioswale using wood chips and uh, biochar. I think they used about a hundred cubic yards of biochar in this. I'm not sure how many wood chips, um, but there are strawberry fields all around this and uh, the straw strawberry fields were, you know, leaching a lot of nutrients coming off into local waterways and causing, uh, uh, eutrophication. So uh, this is, uh, from what I've heard so far, I think it's only a year or two old, um, it's been very effective at uh, minimizing or reducing the amount of these nutrients. So I think there's a big future in this. Um, again, we just need more experimentation. Biochar um, is also um, shown to uh, reduce methane release uh, in ruminants. Uh, and uh, Hans-Peter Schmidt, a very well-known researcher in, in Europe, 
uh, has stated that uh, some 90% of the biochar that's produced in Europe is used in livestock farming first, very small amounts, um, two, three, uh, four percent in cattle feed can reduce the enteric methane by, by up to 25%. There are other ways to do it as well. Apparently seaweed from what I've read can also significantly reduce uh, methane in, in cattle. So uh, this is a big issue. And uh, so uh, potentially this could be one way to help minimize and again, reduce the greenhouse gases. So in case all that isn't enough, uh, I think Kai sent around uh, uh, um, Hans-Peter Schmidt's 55 uses of biochar. I think this is from that. Um, <clears throat> and there are many, many other ways to use biochar um, rather than in soil. <clears throat> and we're, uh, excuse me, we're, um, we're just starting to learn about a lot of these and there's a lot of research in universities across the, uh, the world that are looking into some of these other areas. So just a quick history, um, biochar has been around for thousands of years, biochar production and indigenous, indigenous cultures uh, across the world have used it in agriculture. Uh, but the modern biochar industry and interest in biochar came about in the late 90s and uh, early 2000s when some researchers from Cornell went down to the Amazon uh, to study this uh, soil that's called terra preta or black earth. You can see a sample of it on the right hand side here. Um, the Amazonian soils are notoriously leached and uh, very lacking in soil organic matter. So um, these indigenous cultures um, figured out that by putting uh, large amounts of carbon and they probably put human manure and they used pottery shards and who knows what all, uh, that they created this, these incredibly fertile soils which held the moisture much better. And as you can see here, uh, also made a huge difference in the agricultural production. So uh, when they brought back the, the samples, they discovered that there was about a 40% amount of, uh, of charcoal in these soils. And so they figured, well, if these soils are 100 years old or even you know 1,000 years old and they still had the carbon in it, that maybe we should look at, at uh, biochar or this material burying it and not only improving agriculture, but sequestering the carbon. So that's kind of what started the whole process. And it's, it's grown since then. The modern biochar industry has really only really been around since about 2008. Oops, sorry, I went the wrong way. So to give you an idea of what the potential market is for biochar, um, USBI did a study and uh, kind of looked at what if you took all the agricultural uh, cropland in the US uh, and uh, added about, well, 9.4 tons of, of biochar per acre to increase the soil carbon content. And our, our soils are extremely depleted for the most part of carbon and organic matter. Um, that, that would require almost 3 billion tons of biochar. Um, now, you're not going to put it in all of agriculture because there's some areas that don't want to have more water, you know, as in the south. But um, that's sort of the, the theoretical potential. And here we are at the current use. So we're, we're only producing about 100,000 and using about 100,000 tons. And look at this difference here. So we have a long way to go. And I think you can sort of understand what the potential market is. And it's going to be uh, increasing year on year for uh, as far out as we can see. So the United Nations IPCC special report um, looked at six particularly interesting and uh, potential ways to, to draw down carbon um, from the atmosphere. Um, you, most of you probably know we not only need to uh, reduce the amount of carbon going into the atmosphere, but draw down as much carbon as we can to keep us within the uh, limits. Uh, they looked at six of them, three of them, uh, direct air capture, bioenergy, carbon capture and storage and enhanced weathering are more expensive. They're sort of, they're developing technologies um, and they're, they're pretty expensive right now. Whereas the three that we can actually do right now relatively inexpensively is increase biochar production, increase uh, afforestation and reforestation and increase soil carbon sequestration through uh, you know, no-till and uh, many other ways that we're, we're doing that now. So we should be, you know, really looking at these low um, um, 
cost and easily uh, integrated um, sort of natural climate selection um, um, ways to be able to uh, draw down carbon. So this is a, a really important study. So now I'm going to kind of get into the actual uh, production of biochar. This, uh, this is a picture in wine country. It's kind of showing the worst scenario, uh, burning uh, vines. This was done during the rain, for one, which is totally not the right time to do good burns. Um, and, you know, smoke has a lot of chemicals that are many of which are very nasty and you don't want to don't want to breathe them in. So this is why we're, you know, we're pioneering some of these techniques to not only uh, reduce the smoke, but also to produce biochar. So it's really important to uh, follow the rules with open burning. Um, you need to make sure, most of you know this, that you need to contact your local air quality management district uh, and probably fire officials, Cal Fire or your local uh, uh, fire department to let them know that you're gonna be doing burning. Um, ag burns usually and, and forestry burns usually just require an annual permit. Uh, that just means that you have to check in. You need to make absolutely sure it is an allowable burn day. It's not too windy and that you're, you know, you're following all the safety protocols. You absolutely never want to burn trash. You don't want to burn treated wood. You don't want to burn plastic. Believe me, a lot of people try to do this and that's why uh, burn barrels are outlawed for the most part in California. I think only one air district up in Siskiyou or somewhere up there um, allows it. But uh, you only want to, uh, to burn crop or forestry materials. You, um, and so that's just really important uh, piece to follow. Um, so uh, I'm going to show you some of the ways here that um, we have been tr uh, showing people how to make biochar uh, yourself. We're going to be demoing again two of these processes down on the uh, in your area on the 8th and you're welcome to come watch. Um, so one of the easiest ways and by far the least expensive is what's just called a soil pit kiln uh, where you just dig a pit, uh, you put your materials in there, you keep adding to it over time and then you can either smother it with uh, with soil that you pulled out or you can put it out with water. And it's a very inexpensive way to do it. Again, you want to just uh, only use the good materials, especially if you're making biochar, because you don't ever want to contaminate that with anything, especially if you're going to use it in soil. So only use forestry or ag materials. Um, one of the drawbacks, somewhat, I guess, if you don't have an excavator, is you have to get down in the pit and dig it out. Um, but it can make very, very good biochar um, and very inexpensively. So uh, the techniques that we've been teaching over the last uh, seven or eight years, um, what the first was the conservation burn technique. Uh, it's a very simple alteration of, of doing open pile burning. Um, in a typical open pile, we found that uh, most people end up burning it from the bottom because heat rises, right? So, you, you know, theoretically, you think if you start it from the bottom, then it, uh, it'll rise and it'll burn better. Uh, this technique is you uh, manage the pile a little bit differently in how you prepare it. You have to make sure that it's 20% less in moisture. Uh, and you can, you can purchase very inexpensive uh, moisture, wood moisture meters to test that out. Um, you wanna make sure that there are absolutely no clots of, uh, of dirt. Um, or other material that is going to just cause smoke. Uh, and then you light the pile from the top rather than the bottom. So what happens here then, normally if you light the fire from the bottom, up here it's colder and colder and it just, the, the, it'll start smoking up here and that smoke will just go right up uh, out, out of the pile. Whereas if you light the pile from the top, there's the draft that comes up through the pile, pulls the smoke that then is being produced down here up through the pile and gets incinerated much cleaner. So most people will never even know that you're doing a burn if you use this technique. There's always gonna be some smoke, uh, but it's much, much reduced. And you'll find that the smoke, even sometimes from the side like this will get sucked up through, uh, through the flame front. So this is another uh, pile burn. This was done at, a, again, of a, a grapevines. Um, in this particular case, we lit the pile from the downwind side rather than the upwind side. Most people would uh, think that, you know, you would light it from the upwind side. But 
heat radiates in, in all directions. So if you light it from the downwind side, it's the same principle here. The smoke that would have normally been produced up here gets sucked up through the flame front. You can kind of see it getting pulled in right there. Uh, and it's just a much cleaner burn. So this was probably about, uh, let's see, it was about one and a half hours into the burn. Um, you let the pile burn down. This is about two hours into the burn, starting to ash over. About two and a half hours into the burn, it's really starting to nicely ash over. But at a certain point, pretty soon here, this was another half hour, we actually arrested the, um, and put the fire out at that point to save as much of the carbon as possible. So when you see it kind of ashed over like that, we waited a little bit longer uh, and then we put the pile out and this created a really nice pile of biochar. Now it's not that this is not the most efficient way to make biochar, but we've shown that, you know, people are already doing open burning. So you might as well show them a better way to do it. If they can produce something out of it, they can gather it up, use it in their gardens, use it maybe in their, uh, some wine, uh, some vineyard rows to, to test it out. Um, so it's a, a good way to introduce people to biochar and to, to show that you can make something better out of, uh, uh, out of this quote unquote waste material. So there are a few other methods here. Um, there's lots of experimentation on different ways that you can produce biochar pretty efficiently. This has uh, been pioneered in Europe. It's called the Contiki metal kiln. Um, and it can make a lot of good biochar as well. Uh, in this particular one, you need a, a excavator or backhoe or something to kind of tip that up, but it uh, apparently works pretty well. Then there's um, what, what we call the ring of fire flame cap kilns. And um, these are what uh, our, our organization was able to get through a grant from the North Coast Resource Partnership. Um, they're very, they were um, created by a, a woman named Kelpie Wilson, who's very well known in the biochar community. She's fantastic. She's a great writer and she's an engineer by trade. So she came up with this, this, this uh, design there. It's basically fairly light sheet metal uh, it's just bolted together with wing nuts and bolts. Um, these panels, this is a three panel design. You can go up to five panels. Um, and uh, as you can kind of see here, uh, it's a double panel design. The inner panel is much heavier duty. And then the outer panel um, is, is lighter. These can be moved around, they're mobile. So unlike a pit where you're kind of stuck in one area, you can move these to different parts of the forest or different parts of your farm. Uh, and burn the material where it's at. So uh, this outer panel here is thinner gauge uh, and it, uh, there's three different things that it does. It, it helps insulate the inner panel and, and concentrates the heat on the inside. Um, it also is safer for the people working on the outside because it acts as kind of a buffer. And um, we actually fill in the very, very bottom to make sure no air gets in underneath the inner panels but we do wanna make sure that air can come up between the two panels because that actually feeds up into the flame. Uh, it, it heats up the air and then it feeds down into the kiln. So you fill up your kiln, we'll show you how to do this. Our kilns don't look quite this nice because this was brand new and ours have had a lot of good use, but they work just, just the same. We use a little bit of propane as just as much as we need, you know, we try to minimize that. This was, by the way, a crew of California Conservation Corps, which worked with the Redwood Forest Foundation in this project, and they absolutely loved working on this project, and they learned a lot, learned a lot about biochar, and about not just burning material up to nothing, uh, but that there's a good use for it as well. So as in this particular situation, with the conservation burn, you don't add to it, you just let it burn down, but with the kilns, you keep adding to it over and over, you can see the kind of material that um, is best used in this. Um, it's really not, shouldn't be any larger than about four inches in diameter, maybe four to five foot max uh, in length. And it's really meant for slash materials. It's not meant for big heavy duty stuff. You can kind of see all the slash here, but you keep adding it here and you can see how clean it is. At a certain point, you just kind of let that, those last pieces on top burn down. Might usually takes a half hour to an hour, depending on how much material's in there. Again, this is a good picture showing the, the two panel design. 
you again sort of let it burn down to a certain ash portion. And then you open up the kiln and rake it out, put it out with water. So it's very similar. Um, it is a more concentrated uh, method. It makes a higher quality biochar and um, you can get more biochar out of it, depending of course on how much you fill it up. So it does take some water. Um, it can take 100 to 200 gallons of water uh, to put it out. So it's not water free and that's an issue in California, but we think it's worth uh, saving the carbon. I think it's a good trade-off. So I did want to mention that uh, you might wonder, well, you know, how much are we actually saving from these methods? Um, and we have been working for the last two years with uh, a, a really great guy, uh, Andy Metziger of the um, San Luis Obispo Air Quality Management District, who's also uh, part of the um, CAPCOA, which is the California Air Pollution Control Officers Association on a proposal uh, to quantify life cycle greenhouse gas amounts, dioxin uh, emissions, criteria pollutant reductions, and carbon sequestration potential from uh, the, the uh, conservation burn, the, these kilns, flame cap kilns against uh, um, just a standard open burn pile. We're working with the uh, um, US Forest Service uh, fire science lab up in Missoula, Montana. They're going to be doing uh, testing both up in their lab and also down in the field down in uh, Mendocino County. So we're, we have lots of replicates and we're going to get a lot of good data. So we'll be able to tell exactly what we're saving and what pollutants we're, uh, we are reducing, if any. Um, we think there are because it's it's obvious in watching it compared to a, a regular smoky burn, but we want to find out exactly what that amount is, a, a good average. And we're also working with a really well-known uh, greenhouse gas uh, guy from uh, um, Washington State University, Jim Aminette, who's done a lot of uh, life cycle analyses. So we're really excited about this. We're, we're applying for a CAL FIRE R&D grant for this coming up on March 31st, but we also have our, our shopping around a, a, an ag oriented proposal to CAPCOA and we're hoping to get both funded. So we are looking to, to measure exactly what, uh, get the data that we need to, to really showcase what, what we're doing here. So um, just again, what do you do with the biochar once you have it? Um, you can, uh, you really need to sort of process it in a couple of ways. You need to reduce it down. Ideally, the, the chunks are only about maybe a quarter inch minus, maybe a half inch minus. Um, and you can do that by running it over with a tractor or an excavator, running it over with a truck, or you can get fancy and uh, get, a, you know, get a construction roller, uh, roller and roll over it. Um, if, if you're in a, an area where you can use it in situ, you can just rototill it in right where, it, where, right where it's at. So uh, you do, I think I mentioned this before, you do want to inoculate the biochar or infuse it with nutrients uh, prior to putting it into an agricultural setting. Um, and we recommend blending the biochar with a standard compost vermicompost, Pakashi compost at the start of a batch so that it, it seasons with the compost while it's maturing. Uh, a study has shown that it cre increases the efficacy uh, of that biochar and it, it gets a film over it with interacts, uh, interacts with the fungi, et cetera, and it's just more effective. So you want to let it season as long as you can in, in that compost. You can also just soak it in compost tea uh, overnight before application, but we recommend doing the longer route. The key point that is in most cases, not all, um, we do recommend that biochar should be inoculated with some sort of nutrient source. Uh, you can put it directly into the forest. Um, you know, fires create biochar all the time, just not very much. Um, so you can just return that biochar right to the forest soil. Uh, the Redwood Forest Foundation actually is doing a sort of a long-term study with the biochar that was created up there during their use of the kilns. And they have spread it out over a two acre area. And so they're now gonna be doing soil testing of that in the years to come. So we're excited to kind of see that. So as far as applying it, uh, it, it can be as simple as just you taking that uh, biochar and compost blend and using it as you normally would in, uh, in your uh, agriculture. Uh, you can spread it out as we did here over pasture land. 
Um, there's a lot of interest in that actually too, is uh, to actually, well, actually the Marin Carbon Institute has done some really great work on showing um, how much um, soil organic carbon can be increased um, in soils just by using uh, compost. So we're hoping to, in, uh, to include biochar in that as well. We think it will create more grass, more dense grass, and uh, probably more nutritious grass as well. You can also, there are some companies that make uh, uh, biochar in a, in a powdered form that can actually be added to irrigation, drip irrigation. So that's another interesting uh, way, especially for established crops like vineyards. And uh, biochar could also be blended um, with a, a leguminous cover crop seed when you're doing uh, your you know, winter in between uh, planting. So uh, how much do you use? Um, there isn't any particular uh, recipe that works for all. Uh, they, the rates vary. We're still figuring it out. Um, vineyards, orchards, and row crops likely will have different um, uh, optimal amounts. Um, university studies have used from as little as one to hundreds of tons per acre. But uh, probably the, the average, um, we would say, is around 10 tons per acre. Um, there's a lot of studies that are, that are showing that even much less than that could be um, also effective. So we're just kind of learning about that. Um, there's, again, the biochar industry has only been around for 15 years. So we're, we're sort of where compost was in the, in the beginning and where there's still a lot of study that needs to be done. But there are thousands of studies that show uh, the, these effects that I've uh, described before as being positive. One more thing, um, it's really important if you can to create a space on your property where you annually conduct the burns rather than just burning in the fields if you're uh, ag oriented. Uh, open burning can damage soil temporarily. However, uh, the conservation burn method for one and the kilns don't, won't harm the soil as much as, as just regular jackpot piles or uh, open burn piles because you don't burn all the way down. Um, and it's that last process that can harm soils. Um, so also, if, if you have an area away from your fields or in the forest where this material can season, um, that's a good way to, to get it out of your, uh, you know, get it out of your way while you're doing other work. And if you're worried about disease, you're not going to want to chip and spread that on your farm. So uh, turning it into charcoal, uh, biochar is one good method to, to sort of get rid of this, that disease. Um, this does require some planning and effort, but we believe that, you know, the, the, the positives way outweigh the negatives and that it's definitely worth the time. So I, I'm kind of ending here with a, a few of the larger processes to uh, sort of more efficient uh, ways to make biochar. This was a, called an atom retort. It's basically a big oven. Um, that uh, you put the biomass into, and uh, it, it's a much, it's a very efficient way. There's, it's very low emission, um, but I think this uh, machine cost around two hundred and fifty thousand, as if I recall. Uh, Kelpie's kilns that I showed you earlier are thirteen ninety five or twelve ninety five. I think she's uh, uh, selling them for now, or you can make your own. Um, and it makes about as much as this does. Um, I think this makes two or three cubic yards. And I think Kelpie's uh, kilns can, can make about that much as well in just in one kiln. So you could have multiple kilns. So this was a great experiment. It made absolutely wonderful biochar. We did get this as part of a grant as kind of a demonstration. It was the first unit in California like this. Um, but we ended up selling it to a guy up in uh, a farmer up in Washington who's very happy with with it. Um, this was another project that I worked on up in for the Redwood Forest Foundation up in Piercy, California, where the um, USAL Redwood Forest, uh, they were trying to thin out a lot of the tan oak, which was taking over um, the, the larger trees because they're much faster growing. So rather than just burn them or use chemicals or something, they wanted to be able to uh, see if they could turn it into something uh, better. So. It was a great experiment. Um, we made really good biochar. This machine uh, is from a company in, in Colorado called Biochar Solutions. Um, they discontinued this just because the, um, the labor costs were, uh, were a lot, but um, it made really good biochar and it was a really great experiment. 
and we're learning as we go. There's a lot of these um, technologies which are now just emerging and they're improving uh, and getting more efficient, et cetera. This was also, uh, while it did flare um, a lot of the emissions, we were able to reuse the heat from the flare to use in a dryer. So uh, we put the chips in here. These, these machines, by the way, use chips. They don't use the larger pieces like the kilns and the conservation burn. So you put the, the, the biomass chips in here, convey it up to the dryer. We use the heat from the flare to dry that, went up again into a conveyor, into another bin, and then into the retort. So it was a, it was a really neat project. Here are a couple other uh, machines. Um, this is a Pyreg system out of Germany. It's a pyrolysis unit. Um, this is a company called uh, ARDI, or Advanced Renewable Technologies International. Um, the Sonoma Ecology Center was able to get a, uh, a containerized unit uh, ordered as part of a, another CAL FIRE grant that we're working on. We're um, working on the um, emissions and other permitting issues. Uh, we're going to be uh, citing this at Mare Island, we hope, within six months. Um, and we're going to be producing our own biochar, working with a, a tree care company that was producing 800 cubic yards of chips a week in this area. And now we're going to be converting as much of that as we can into biochar. It had previously a lot of it been landfilled. So we're, we're diverting this material from the landfill, producing and upscaling a, a product. And then we're going to be disseminating this material out into the local community, local community gardens and uh, home gardens and, and uh, municipal landscaping. So it's really, a, a, these are the kinds of things that we're trying to work towards. Um, and I'll show you one more project at the end. So uh, just a couple more here. There's uh, uh, the, These are air curtain burners. You've probably heard of these. Um, the Forest Service, I think, has purchased a bunch of these. And there's a lot of interest. A lot of the air districts are starting to allow um, uh, use of these. But the air burners have traditionally been focused on incineration, not on producing biochar. Um, they're starting to... Uh, innovate with uh, um, something called a char boss, which they've uh, done in, in collaboration with the Forest Service. Um, and uh, it's sort of a smaller tow around type thing. And some of the uh, real creative vineyard and forestry management companies are adapting some of the larger air curtain burners to also produce biochar. However, there is a, uh, another technology called a tiger cat carbonator or carbonizer. Um, which was built specifically to produce biochar and, um, and also to, to um, has a throughput, a very large throughput. So um, while the Pyreg unit, the RD unit might be able to process 10 to 40 tons per day, um, this can process 12 to 15 tons per hour <coughs> uh, and while it's also producing a large amount of biochar. It's maybe only a 10% conversion, but since it, it processes so much material, it ends up pr uh, producing a lot of biochar. So over 2,000 hours of operation in a year, it can process uh, some 24,000 tons of material with very low particulate release. It's very it's similar to an air curtain burner, and while conserving about 2,400 tons of carbon in the form of biochar. So why aren't we doing this? It's just uh, so kind of beyond us who are in the in the industry, it's really education and it, it it's money as well. It takes money to to run these and purchase them. So we did uh, consult with a, a forester, a, a really great guy named Dan Falk in Sonoma County, who purchased one of these units, the first one in California. He's been experimenting with it for a couple of years uh, on his family's property up in uh, in Sonoma County. Um, he does also lease this machine and he can provide a crew and equipment to operate the system. Um, so if you're interested, you can contact me about that. This kind of shows um, what the uh, product looks like. There are actually three different augers that at the bottom of the carbonator that pull out the carbon as it's being uh, produced. And it's also cooled at that time. It's then conveyed up and can actually go right into a dump truck right there. Uh, cool enough to be able to be uh, taken then to uh, wherever it's going to be processed. And uh, lastly here, uh, these are uh, large scale production systems. Um, actually, most of the biochar in California and across the country is produced as a 
byproduct of cogen facilities. Um, this is the, the Oregon Biochar Solutions uh, plant. Uh, I think it's up in White City, Oregon, Southern Oregon. Produces 30 megawatts of power and truckload quantities of biochar. They have a really, really high quality biochar product that they've uh, been able to uh, produce. Pacific Biochar um, also is a California producer and they've been able to um, uh, convert some of the existing um, biomass uh, power plants to produce a higher quality biochar, just like this plant does. And uh, Phoenix Energy is another company that is specializing in sort of one to actually five megawatt plants now. Um, and uh, they uh, are converting the biomass into electricity and then also uh, producing biochar as well. So just to kind of wind things up here, uh, I just, I love this slide. It just, it, you know, we're trying to teach that, that there's no such thing as waste in nature. And we've been really good as a society at wasting stuff. So we really need to look at, uh, at what we're doing. And I just wanted to, uh, my last slide here, I just wanted to show that this great project that's still uh, under construction sort of being worked on, it's called the Wind River Project. But what I wanted to show you here is just kind of a, a kind of a, a great circular use of, uh, of wait, quote unquote waste material. They call it trash, it's not trash. They, you know, use forestry material, bad wording there. But basically, you know, you're taking material that's, you know, could be used in a better way. They're processing it into sort of grading it into different grades of material that can be used in different ways. Some of it can be fed into produce electricity. Uh, that can be used to charge electric cars or, you know, heat homes or do whatever. Uh, and it could also, some of the heat or electricity could be used to, uh, in hydroponics and greenhouses, can produce fish, can produce heat, can produce electricity, biochar, even kiln dried cordwood or firewood. So we're, we're really looking to try to develop biomass campuses or biomass depots in, in communities that can look at the waste material, quote unquote, waste material um, as in a much better way to convert it into things much better. So that's my uh, presentation. We will be available for questions. Um, Kai, I believe, is going to play this short video right now, which will kind of show you uh, some of this in action. So Kai, take it over. Yeah, thanks, Raymond. That was uh, fantastic. I I'm going to save the video for after noon. So for those that need to take off, I want to take some questions before we show that video. And for those following along the chat, I did post the link for that video. So if you copy that link and just, you know, put it into a web page, Chrome or whatever, uh, you can find this video. We'll play in just a few minutes if you do have to take off by noon. So I want to make sure I'm paying attention to time here. Um, but uh, Arthur, you had two questions here. And um, if you're still, are you, are you still around, Arthur? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you want to just ask your questions to Raymond, I think that'll um, speed up me interpreting your questions. Yeah, thanks. Raymond, thank you so much for this presentation. Super informative and really inspiring. It's very hopeful, which is what we all need <laughs> right now. So thank you. Thank you. I was curious, um, and I'll try to just put them in, in one, one question. That, so is there a, a right scale? You know, you showed us some small scale, some large scale. Is there anything that's too small or too big for biochar? And then my other one was, if you apply it directly to the forest floor, you know, what stops it from running off in the next large rain event? And that was, those are my questions. Thank you. Yeah, so we need all scales. <laughs> you know, there's, as I showed you there, there's so much potential for it. Uh, it really depends on what you're doing. Do you, is it just something you want to do with your material and your, you know, your small farm? Is it something that you're trying to process large amounts like you could do in the carbonator? Um, you know, there's really, we need it all. There is no one scale, but if you're, if you're looking to do commercial type work, you know, there's a scale there. You need to be producing tons of material and et cetera. Um, the second question, we're Arena, still- let me jump on this is David, sure. Uh, sure. on that. The, the real issue Arthur has to do, of course, with costs, uh, versus revenues versus carbon offsets, which are beginning to be in, uh, available. I'm pushing hard. I don't know if I'll be successful for aggregation of a series of small units to, to uh, compete for carbon offsets, probably at a discounted value. 
because there won't be as much verification of all of the quality of the system, but at least we'll keep them in the game and the whole thing won't be biased just for big capital intensive projects. The kind of piece that showed at the end of Raymond's excellent presentation of the 30 megawatt uh, uh, systems that can produce potentially a large, large volume of biochar, we're looking at $30 million on the capital side, plus a lot of O&M. So not everybody has that kind of cash in their pocketbook. Uh, there's a lot of innovation in Africa, for example, a very small scale, very inexpensive labor related to cook stoves, related sometimes to uh, the, the management of other kinds of waste materials, of, of corn stalks and so on, which don't produce great quality, but it's better than just burning them. Uh, and you get ten, a potential large volume with aggregation of small scale. So part of, uh, part of what we've been fighting about uh, or fighting against Raymond and I and our teams over 10 years is the high cost of available units. It is as if the uh, innovators in the field want to recover their full set of R&D costs in the first se or unit sale. So the capital cost of these units gets expensive that produces expensive biochar that farmers don't want to pay for. So we're in this sort of struggle to get to scale. It's as if if we had to buy a car, whether gasoline or electric, made in somebody's garage by an expert mechanic, the car might run great, but it's going to be very expensive. We're, we're pre-Henry Ford in the biochar game, and we need to get somehow to scale the way Mr. Ford finally did. Uh, for automobile. Thank you. So the answer to the second question is we're still working on that. There's a really great um, U.S. Forest Service researcher named Debbie Page Dumrose. You can look her up. She's done a lot of work in forest um, areas. And as I mentioned, the Redwood Forest Foundation um, is doing this study as well. Um, you know, they're, they're, depending on how you do it, the, the CCCs actually took buckets of biochar and spread it out over, you know, areas that had been treated. Um, we'll find out how much of it is still there. Uh, I think some of it may run off, but, you know, biochar is a natural phenomenon. You know, fire is part of the landscape, so a, a small amount of biochar is produced um, naturally. So it's not going to hurt if it gets into... Uh, you know, local creeks and stuff, you wouldn't want to have tons of it. But, you know, just the, the amounts that we're looking at here probably would not be a problem. But we're still we're still looking at that. One of the areas I'm particularly interested in in forest placement of biochar made in and around the forest has to do with forest roads, typically dirt roads with slope. And you get a huge amount of runoff off those, off those roads. By putting the biochar down slope, with some stabilization, you use its ability to capture runoff as well as getting carbon out of the atmosphere, as Raymond said, two and a half uh, pounds per pound as a way to move forward and capture some of the runoff that's a really major problem off forest roads. And it's a way to, to help regenerate um, forest roads that are no longer being used. That's one of the things that Debbie has looked at. So I think, you know, to help regenerate the soil and, you know, bring it back to health after all of it's uh, being run off. So Jason has a question, it looks like. Before Jason jumps on, um, if anyone needs to jump off, you sure can. I'll, I'll have this uh, meeting going for the next half an hour or so. If anyone wants to stay on, feel free. And anybody who needs to jump can. Uh, does anyone have a question right now and they need to leave? We'll take those questions first. If not, as um, part of as part yeah. of why I had my had my hand up, Kai. I, I did yeah, Jason. Okay. I just, yeah, I, I put it in the chat. I mean, I thank you so much to to those of you who put this together. I work for the Forest Service, and certainly the the value and potential of biochar. As I put in the chat, it's it's quite incredible. I mean, we're looking at different ways in the in the scope of climate change and restoration, trying to to reintroduce tree species where we've had type conversion. I think there's just a lot of unique opportunity with biochar. I, I think the, the flip side of that is I've, as I've looked at the, the cost for us to do restoration and reestablish tree stands in areas that have been type converted, it's the scope and scale of treating standing 
forest, the, the areas that are susceptible to type conversion from catastrophic wildfire, it's easier for us to maintain that than to try to reestablish it. And I'm just, I'm just curious, how do you see the scope and scale of biochar given the labor intensity and the cost? Does that work in harmony with trying to restore our landscapes literally in the millions of acres across California before we lose more forest to high desert, as an example, the, the type converts, especially in the montane Southern California forest. So just curious what your perspective and lens you're looking through on that, certainly as you're pre-Henry Ford on this, but the, the labor intensity, I think, is something that I see as a forest manager looking at large landscapes that could be an Achilles heel for us. Yeah, well, you're, you're right. I mean, it, it can be very intensive, particularly if you're doing, for instance, the kilns. Uh, and the Redwood Forest Foundation was very lucky to have the sea crews uh, come in and, uh, you know, they like 14 people in the crew and, and you know, they did a, they, they loved doing it, but, you know, some of that work was paid for by the state through them. And so it can be very labor intensive. Um, however, we need to get people out into the forest. And uh, Kelpie talks about this a little bit in the video that, that uh, you know, maybe some of you can see. But you know, we need to get people out into the forest, and uh, there's a lot of people that aren't, don't have jobs, and uh, you know, for especially young people, and getting people, young people, out into the forest areas and doing something positive, uh, I think has a lot of potential. David's actually been wor uh, working with a veterans group, um, looking at possibly hiring expats that maybe don't have jobs or homeless or whatever, uh, that could learn some of these techniques. So. Yeah, it, it, it can be labor intensive. Uh, Debbie uh, Page Dumrose, who you probably know, um, has, uh, the Forest Service has actually come up with a, a spreader system. So instead of doing it with buckets like the Redwood Forest Foundation did, uh, they actually can you know go up and down these roads and, and apply it really quickly through this uh, sort of uh, an adapted spreader. So I think it's, I, we are very early in this and we do need to, um, look at the, you know, cost benefit ratio and return on investment. And uh, as we do that, um, we're going to figure out more and more efficient ways to uh, both make it and apply it. So the answer is, we're, we're, we don't know exactly we're developing, but, you know, my hope is, as we get further into this, that we're, we're going to have very efficient systems. Some of them can be done right there in the forest. You don't have to transport the material anywhere. Um, and, you, and that material can then just go right back into the forest through mechanized means in some cases. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. Raymond, let me jump in just a little bit more on that. Excellent. And sorry, I had to grab a critical call. Uh, at least I did a mute while I was on the stupid telephone. Uh, there are increasing potential for public-private partnerships that change the private sector ROI in the right direction to get it to at least an attractive point. Uh, these are being looked at by five pilot projects throughout Northern California, at least in 16 counties uh, that have been funded by the Governor's Office of Planning and Research. These are called wood utilization pilot projects. We hope to see them spread statewide. I know you're not in Northern California, this team, but uh, the idea is to figure out where we need to reduce forest slash in order to reduce forest fire risk, do it with things like these kilns and other uh, devices that uh, might not produce the right private sector ROI, and then figure out how much public sector, basically tax-based funding needs to supplement the private sector revenues from the biochar. So there isn't much yet for sure about this, but it's a fascinating concept of a way to get us to the right level of carbon sequestration and forest fire risk reduction at a cost that society can cover by a combination of private and public funding. All right, John Davis had a question about LCAs. John, you still on? Yeah, I, I'm here. Thank you. Um, so I work in uh, recycling and organics management field. I'm on uh, the California Commission on Recycling Market Development and curbside recycling. We've we've learned a lot about um, 
organics management and states entering into a new era of uh, organics management as of January 1. Uh, there's been a lot of focus on compost and mulch. It looks like the LCA that you showed compares the, the process that they're utilizing to open um, agricultural burns. And I, I wonder if you have any thoughts about how you would compare it to the, the uses that I work in, um, mulching, for example, um, in, in composting woody material, which by the way, a, a proper aerated composting system doesn't produce uh, methane. That's why we're, <laughs> that's why the state centered in this new era of uh, getting organic material out of, uh, out of landfills. But uh, are, are there any LCAs that you're familiar with that would compare your process to, for example, a, a mulch and mulching application? Well, again, um, when you are creating biochar, you're putting it into a recalcitrant stable state. So that material will not degrade for a long period of time. When you're composting, most of that uh, CO2 that's in that plant material will eventually go right back up into the atmosphere. Some of it will create uh, you know, soil organic matter or carbon in the soil, but a lot of it goes right back up into the atmosphere. But we need that mulching, composting, it's all good. But for, for example, um, the Sonoma Compost Company, um, years ago, I did a, a project for them um, where about 15% of the material that was coming into that composting facility was um, too big to really compost properly without a lot of uh, processing and stuff. And so they wanted to take that 15%. Uh, they had been... Um, taking that and putting it uh, into cogen facilities at a high cost. So they were looking at, well, maybe we can, uh, you know, that 15% portion, why don't we turn that into biochar and utilize that right into our compost product and charge more for it. Um, so they ended up not doing it. Uh, they ended up actually having to move and everything. But um, anyway, I think that there's, that there's a, it's not an either or, it's an addition to um, both and, and I think a portion of the material um, should be and can be, and it, we, I, I'm not aware to answer your question of any specific ROI on that. However, we're working with a, a, a tree care company. Uh, we're hoping to get a win a Cal Fire grant, which will be looking specifically at the range of technologies. Uh, they produce between 150 and 300 tons of chips per day in this one area. And um, so they're looking at what are we going to do with all this? And yeah, we can compost some of it, but um, you know, there just isn't a, a large enough market yet. And I know that there are these state rules that are going to require municipalities to, to pay for it and use it. But um, you know, it, again, we're still learning about that. So I, but I do think that some portion of uh, materials that are coming into um, landfills um, or compost companies could be turned into biochar and added as a value added product uh, to enhance um, the efficacy of the compost even. Yeah, so the, the, when I looked at the literature you provided, it, it suggested that somewhere between 20 to, I think, was it, you're, you're losing in the burning process, you're losing somewhere between 80 and 50% of the CO2 you're emitting it instantly? In some processes, yeah. 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 Yes, so if you're doing a pile burn, it's very inefficient. But yeah. you know, it's like, what are they doing now? They're burning it all up, or are you gonna save 20% of so, it? So you're or, really focused on the agricultural slash for, uh, I guess, the forest. Um, we're focused on both. It's, it's important for both. I mean, there's an enormous amount of forestry material. Uh, I think most of the ag, to be honest, most of the ag waste, you know, the, the NRCS has been working for years to get farmers to put that material back into the soil uh, and not burn it up. And so I think, you know, if it's organic like that, uh, you know, but the more, the, the woodier material, the denser material, that material can produce really good biochar and, and should, um, we think so, but it's just a portion of it. It does not going to be all of it, but yes, you're right. So, you know, I mean, compared to, uh, well, compared to composting, you know, a, a higher amount of that, 
or, or less of the CO2 is going to go back up into the atmosphere if you char it. The machines that we showed can go up to 50% conversion rate, which is pretty good. Uh, still 50% is going to be uh, uh, emitted, but that's still 50% savings over what we're doing now. On some of the sophisticated machines, including the one we have a grant to bring into Vallejo in the Bay Area, have sophisticated air pollution control devices, uh, afterburners on the back end, so that we're anticipating very low emissions. We've done initial emissions testing on our machine and the numbers are very attractive in terms of very limited air emissions. And we've we also- A lot of efficiency that way, but that's a machine that costs upwards of a half million dollars. So um, most of us don't have that in our pocketbook. The kilns are $1,300. Uh, each as opposed to $600,000 for this sophisticated machine. It's a whole range of, of activities that can occur. And Jim Amanet, this LCA researcher from Washington State, said the kilns can uh, produce uh, or convert between 20 and 50%, um, depending on how it's done. So that's pretty darn good for $1,300 to be able to, to have a mobile uh, option like that. Okay. Hey, I just, in, there's a large anaerobic digestion project underway in Rialto, um, Energia. And yes, they're, they're working on the They're actually done. trying to make biochar. At the end. Yeah, and they're working a lot with biosolids, which is another piece that we haven't directly worked with. There's one in Redwood City in the Bay Area that's similar, and the Energia process is a very exciting new development to, to be dealing with some of the uh, POTW sludges that are coming out the back end. Hey, John, that was a good line of uh, questions there. Um, Justin, are you still on? Maybe he just signed out. Justin had a question, and I'll voice that question if I can find it here. Um, Dustin McLean from County Parks in Riverside, he asked, does campfire ash have any benefit? Um, or too much O2 during burn to complete burn? I assume this is like just regular campfires. Um, I think that's what his question is pertaining to. People have been using ash for years, uh, you know, either out of their stoves or um, wherever. It does have some nutrients in it, but it's very, very low carbon. Uh, but there are some nutrients in it. So yeah, it, it can be useful, but why not, uh, um, you know, arrest the process and save as much of the carbon as you can. And there is some residual ash there as well. Um, all of these processes can have some amount of ash in it. A really good high quality biochar would have 85% carbon and 15% ash. Um, but, you know, campfire might have 2% carbon and 98% ash. So, you know, it's what do you want to produce out of it? But yes, I think there's probably some benefit from that, but I'm not an expert in that, in that part. So if there are any additional questions, I wanted to share this video. It's five minutes long, so you can uh, watch it or you can play it on your own time after this meeting or whenever. But um, this is the video we were talking about a little while ago. Are we going to take more questions afterwards, Kai, or those of us that have seen the video want to bail? Oh, this is not playing. Should I try it on my machine? Yeah, it's not showing any audio. It's skipping. Is it not showing anything? Not right, showing. Raymond, do you want to try it on yours? Yeah, go ahead. Let me let me try it. Let's see if I can if I still have it here. Hang on. Yes, yeah, so if you've got additional questions, you can um, just ping me with an email and I can get you in contact with Raymond or David. Um, okay. and I can have a group chat afterwards. Okay, I can share my screen now. Uh, share, okay. Okay, can you see that? Yes. So we have a big problem in our forests. We have been excluding fire from ecosystems that are used to having fire, uh, natural wildfire, and also fires that were deliberately set as a, a, a management tool by indigenous people that kept these forests really stable for a long time. 
now we've let those fuels build up and we've not logged appropriately in a lot of areas and we have drought that's probably a result of climate change. So we have very big problems. Ultimately, we need to reintroduce fire to the landscape. And what, what landscape fire does is it actually produces a lot of charcoal. So these forest soils naturally have a lot of charcoal in them from their long history of fire. So we need to put the charcoal back. So what we're doing is a form of biomimicry. We're actually doing creating charcoal, which is a natural part of the environment, and we can spread that charcoal back in the forest in a safe way. So from that standpoint, it's, uh, it's very beneficial in communities. Um, it can be used again in community gardens and backyard gardens. Our biochar is charcoal that's compatible with biological systems. So what biochar lets us do is it lets us have a better alternative for treating all this small material. And it has a lot of different applications and uses. So we get carbon sequestration, we get far less smoke, and we save our soils, and we get the biochar. Uh, the advantage of, of charring it rather than chipping it is when you chip material, if you just chip it and then landfill it or chip it and spread it out in the forest even, it, all that CO2 or most of it that's in, it encompassed in that plant material is going to degrade and go right up in the atmosphere. When you char it, uh, about 50% of that plant material can be kept in a recalcitrant or very stable form. So the demonstrations we're doing today include three different processes at different scales. Uh, we can start with the conservation burn, which is a simple way of uh, lighting your pile differently than what you would normally do. Normally you light it from the bottom. In this case, you light it from the top, you manage it, you let it burn down, you put it out with water. My fault. Produces better biochar. Uh, and then we have uh, Dan Falk's carbonizer. Uh, made by Tiger Cat, which is a much more industrial scale uh, and uh, can process anywhere from 10 to 18 tons per hour. With our project, we're, we're going to have a soil uh, monitoring component. So we will be able to look at what the effect of biochar on forest soils is over time. Um, and also, if you're going to burn forest slash like we do regularly with our open burn piles. Why not capture some of that carbon and um, keep it on site? So, so it seems like it's a win-win situation. We'll get more concerned about climate change and more realizing we actually really need to do something about it. Uh, biochar is going to be one of the answers, but in able to convince society to put resources behind it, we have to show them. We have to give them the numbers. It's important to do these projects to introduce what biochar is and also see um, how we can fund more fuels reduction projects and, and help get more of this work done throughout California. If we have an opportunity to find out what carbon sequestering through biochar application to our fields will do and help our fertility, health of our cattle, we think that's a fabulous opportunity. I think the beautiful thing about it is it's very fulfilling work. So you are out here in the woods, you're touching the land, you're hearing the birds sing, and you're cutting up wood and, you know, turning it into biochar. You know you're doing good. It gives people hope for the future, which is probably one of the things we're lacking the most right now, especially our youth. So giving them a chance to put their hands on the land, to make their mark, to do something about this climate problem that we hear about all the time, but nobody really gives us really concrete solutions. This is something very concrete you can hold in your hand. So there you go. Are there any additional questions? All right, so if not, I think we will likely end here. 
Uh, thank you for staying on a little bit longer. So I made a recording. And if anyone's interested in um, obtaining the recording, I can send that to you. I think I'll be able to do that based on file size. Um, we'll figure it out one way or the other. Um, but if you are available to uh, meet us in the field April 8th at the Oakland uh, Preserve, we'll be demonstrating the flame cap kiln uh, on that Friday. So please let me know if you're interested in attending. All right. Thank you all. Have thank a good you. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.